Hi everyone. My name is Kaylee Bodily. I serve as an Eric Zachary Wood Research Assistant and Team Lead on the Quill Project in the Center for Constitutional Studies. On behalf of the Center and Utah Valley University, let me welcome you to our annual First Amendment Conference. This year's theme is Some Assembly Required, Freedom of Association, and the Right to Assembly. This afternoon's panel will examine the important role that the freedom of association plays in a pluralistic society and some of the ongoing controversies that continue to arise from the efforts of courts to protect this important First Amendment right. We are joined by three eminent scholars of constitutional law. Bradley A. Smith is the Josiah H. Blackmore II and Shirley M. Nault Professor at Capital University Law School in Columbus, Ohio. He previously served as, commis as a commissioner, vice chairman, and chairman of the Federal Elections Commission between 2000 and 2005. His scholarship on the First Amendment and campaign finance regulation has appeared in Yale Law Journal, Georgetown Law Journal, Harvard Journal of Regulation, and the Pennsylvania Law Review. His work has been cited in a number of Supreme Court opinions. He's a frequent, frequent contributor to the national debate on the meaning and scope of the First Amendment. Dr. Luke C. Sheehan is an assistant professor of pol political science at Duquesne University and a non-resident scholar in the Program for Research on Religion and Urban Civil Society at the University of Pennsylvania. His recent book, Why Associations Matter, The Case for First Amendment Pluralism is a vibrant defense of the freedom of association and its importance to our civil society. Moderating this afternoon's discussion is William C. Duncan, who currently serves as a Constitutional Law and Religious Freedom Fellow at the Sutherland Institute. He formerly worked in the Law and Religion Program at the Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law. He's a frequent contributor to national debates on constitutional law with more than 75 articles in leading law reviews and scholarly journals. journals. Numerous briefs in the Supreme Court and other appellate courts and frequent contributions to national publications such as National Review, SCOTUS Blog, and The American Spectator. Please join me in welcoming our guests. Well, thank, thank you so much for being here, and thank you for uh, that kind introduction. Uh, my mom worked really hard on that bio, and so she's grateful when you read that. <laughs> um, I, I, really, I really feel so honored to be uh, on this well, I shouldn't say on the panel, but, but hosting the panel because our, our contributors are so remarkable. I'd like uh, to begin really in a basic way, as I, I mentioned earlier, and to talk about what we mean when we talk about associations. Interestingly enough, my daughter yesterday, who's in a, a senior in high school, texted me about midday and said, what is, a free, what is the freedom of association? And so this is our chance that maybe I'll have a better answer for than I texted yesterday. But, but do you want to just begin? When we're talking about associations, what are we thinking of? So when we're talking about associations, we mean gatherings of individuals around a variety of purposes. Um, and virtually any purpose you can think of. So it can be small gathering, one or two, or well, two or more, I think is the... Uh, as the line, um, going all the way up to uh, large, think of um, uh, large nonprofits that, uh, that employ thousands of people um, and uh, work across continents. Um, so when we're thinking about associations, we mean broadly that world. Um, we call it the nonprofit world or the civil society world. Um, we tend to distinguish between uh, the strictly economic associations and governments. So by the associations, we mean everything else. So it's a very broad category. Um, think civil society, I think is the best term. And when we're talking about the freedom of association, we mean the freedom for those associations to form, to come together around their purposes, to discriminate in membership and hiring based upon their purposes and what they're trying to accomplish, to form at will, to come apart at will, and that sort of thing. Perfect. Anything you want to add? Well, I can talk a little bit about uh, the, the roots of the right of association sure, sure. In, in the First Amendment. Uh, you know, so, so for the students here, you didn't know there's going to be an immediate quiz, but can you name the rights that are protected by the First Amendment? There are five. And can you give you a second just to think? You don't have to volunteer. Okay, so you've got religion, speech, press, assembly, petition. What's missing? Association. 
There's no right to association. And it doesn't appear elsewhere in the, in the Constitution either. So where does this right even come from that we're talking about for people to engage in this kind of civil society and all these types of organizations that are so plentiful in the United States that Tocqueville talked about and so on? And it's one of those rights that I think uh, some people say, you know, you can't find this through originalist theory, but I think you can, or, or almost any other theory, that comes from the overarching structure of the Constitution and the many specifically protected rights. So, for example, uh, freedom of speech, the Supreme Court uh, first noted in the 1950s in a case called NAACP versus Alabama that freedom of speech is greatly enhanced by association, that it matters if somebody speaks as, you know, the uh, Episcopal Church or as the National Rifle Association or as the AFL-CIO that it speaks as a group, but it can also enhance uh, people's ability to talk within a group. A lot of people are very shy or they have business or personal or various reasons not for wanting to be up front in stating particular views, and the association allows the group to make the views or some spokesperson for the association. It also applies, obviously, to freedom of press, right? You don't have uh, producing a newspaper or radio broadcast or anything involves people associating, so it comes out of the press. Uh, it would seem to come out of assembly. You're going to have a couple people assemble, so it would, it would appear there some right to association if you're going to assemble. But it also comes from other areas, rights that we don't get as much respect from the Supreme Court, so we don't talk about as much, like the right to freedom of contract. What is a contract other than associating with someone and defining the terms of your association with someone. So when you go over to the Taco Bell out here, you have a little contract with them. You're going to give them some money. They're going to give you some food. It's a pretty simple, basic deal to much more complex contracts that talk about long-term relationships and so on. And then you've got as well the right to property. And that is uh, one of the, the, I think, hottest areas now that I think we'll, we'll talk about more. For example, some of you may be aware there are a couple of cases up at the Supreme Court now involving social media laws passed by the state of Florida and by the state of Texas. And both these laws, they're very complex and they're different from one another, but basically put, both of them are trying to uh, have a state rule that, that social media companies can't discriminate against speech on viewpoints. If you want to post, they can't delete your post or delete your account because of what you're posting. Well, if you think about it, they've, that has been framed largely as a First Amendment right, but if you really think think about it, I think what they're actually arguing is for a, a sort of property right, a right to exclude others from their property, or we might say a right to association. They say, I don't want these people using my platform, our platform as a corporation, to speak. We don't want to be associated with that speech. And that really, I think, to me, comes more out of their property rights than out of their speech rights. So a lot of places, and then we got the Ninth Amendment and so on, So, which if you don't know the Ninth Amendment, it's the one that says... Anything that's not specified here is left to the people. So that's a good one. So lots of possibilities here. That's perfect. Thank you. What a helpful beginning. We, we think of the First Amendment as being foundational, whether that was you know intentional. I guess the, the, the understanding is it was maybe just an accident that it's first. I think a providential accident maybe because it's so foundational to other rights. Um, the right of association, why, why is it important that we protect that right? I mean, what, what are we hoping to protect as we protect free association? That question makes sense. I'll, I'll go first, and and, and let me go on. I, I think we're protecting exactly what Luke talked about, and you know I mentioned there's several points from this. Most of us can't imagine uh, living without having some protection for our association. You know, could the government go in and tell you you can't associate with those people, and or you must associate with certain people, uh, and so that's what we'll start to I think. You know, talk about as we flesh this out is is how. But how would you live your life if if all of your, uh, you know, two or more people getting together was was regulable by the federal government? So a lot of the big questions that we have come down to that question: is to what extent can the government regulate people's private associations? And even though, as I say, association doesn't appear specifically in the Constitution, in many ways it's necessary to to engage in almost. You know, most of the other rights that are guaranteed, property, contract, speech, press, religion, and so on. Thank you. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, that's exactly right. Uh, and I think a, a helpful way of understanding it is actually in the debates over the assembly clause. Uh, so in the, in the first Congress, when they're debating the, the wording of the First Amendment or what would come to be the First Amendment, uh, there was a move to strike the assembly clause uh, from the First Amendment. The reason given uh, by Sedgwick from Massachusetts is that it was so obvious 
It was demeaning to the dignity of the house to descend to such minutia. That was his line. Uh, so it wasn't that he was against it. He thought it was so obvious, he didn't understand why they were putting it in. Uh, and he said, no one is going to challenge the right of assembly. How could you even have free speech if you can't assemble to talk? All right, it takes at least two uh, for speech to make any sense. Freedom of the press, same thing. You've got to have multiple people uh, exercising that right, a publisher, an editor, a writer, and so on, to worship. Obviously, people have to assemble to worship. Um, so he said, I don't, I don't understand why we even have it here. Uh, and John Page of Virginia responded that it was obvious that it was protected. Nonetheless, he said, uh, it, has been, uh, it has been violated. And men have been forced to remove their hats before the face of authority. It's an entirely obscure historical point that he makes there that almost no one gets today. At the time, uh, as one scholar said, it was worth a half hour of oratory, that one comment. It was a reference to William Penn, who was arrested for violating uh, the, the uh, Conventicle Act of 1664, because he gathered with his fellow Quakers uh, in violation of that act that did not permit non-Anglicans uh, to congregate in, I think, more than five people. He did so, he's arrested in 1670, and he refuses to remove his hat in front of the English judge, and he's held in contempt. Uh, now, needless to say, the founders were on the side of William Penn in that, uh, that dispute, but it brought up the point that assembling or association could be threatened. And so you needed to protect it. And what were they referring to? A group of a handful of people doing something outside of a sort of state-sanctioned uh, state or political, uh, political activity. And in this case, it was, it was to worship as Quakers, as dissenters. Uh, and so it was a kind of broad reference to non-political or what we think of as civil society activity. And uh, this is, you know, this debate's taking place right after the ratification of the Constitution. And during this time, there's an explosion of such groups, uh, not just religious groups, but civil society groups, kind of up and down the eastern seaboard, especially in the middle and, and upper states. Uh, so Americans had written their state constitutions uh, during the revolutionary period. They, of course, written two federal constitutions. Uh, that, and as you know, actually many more than 13 state constitutions they had to try a few times. Um, but prior to that, they had written many of their town charters, um, which were basically, in many cases, voluntary associations. You'd move to a town, form a town charter, start a church, uh, and carry on. Uh, and they form all these civil society associations. And what would they do? Four people, 10 people, or 50 would get together, they'd write up a constitution for their group, and they took those constitutions so seriously, uh, if they decided to meet on Wednesday nights instead of Thursday nights, they'd get together and amend their constitution <laughs> to, to uh, account for that change in their activity. Uh, so when we're talking about associations, we're talking about this broad civil society protection um, that was engaged in by nearly everyone, um, was involved in some group or another, or multiple groups. Um, Ben Franklin started several of these. Uh, the uh, American Philosophical Association, um, which its name is self-explanatory, is still here today. Uh, and uh, Junto, which was a group of, uh, of uh, people who were going to come together and uh, they were going to read their, each other's works and read kind of self-improvement society was basically what he was after. So it's basically anything um, falls under this category. And we see it very early in American history. Tocqueville shows up. He sees that Americans are doing this around everything, and he sees that Americans do it without talking about it. They just see it as it's part of how you engage in self-government in the broadest sense possible. In fact, he notes that children even do it, <laughs> make up their own games, have their own associations. So this is broad protection for a broad uh, right, broadly activity in kind of the most extensive sense uh, that they could conceive of. T Tocqueville's kind of an important figure in this, in the kind of as we think about this issue, because he uh, identifies association as one of the genius, uh, ge geniuses, or uh, element of genius in the, in the American experiment. What, what, what was what was the thinking there? Why was that so? Why, why did he? What, uh, what was his and maybe others as well? I mean, earlier Edmund Burke, but more recently maybe Robert Nisbet, all the people who talked about mediating institutions and the. Uh, in this century, what 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 were they? Cons what what did they think was so special? What was important about associations in that? Well, uh, for Tocqueville, he's a European and uh, a French aristocrat, and he saw that in European societies, especially Britain, uh, when important things happened, it was generally because an aristocrat acted. He, of course, had under him 
people who worked for him, he could make things happen. Uh, and uh, you would see kind of great uh, undertakings done by aristocrats. And he has this great line where he says, when you look to Britain, you see a great undertaking. It's an aristocrat. In France, it's the government. But in America, it's associations. So he says, America doesn't have these aristocrats. They don't have single individuals who can exert enormous influence because of the institution that resides under them. Uh, so you need an equivalent of that. Uh, and for Americans, they have associations. They develop their own equivalent of these large persons who can act through society uh, and get things done and also uh, serve as a sort of counterweight uh, to the government. Uh, so what do you do about this government? And so he's anticipating, he calls it the, uh, the tyranny of the majority. Uh, so for a while, you see this in Tom Paine and in others. There was a sense that now that we've thrown off the monarchy, thrown off the aristocracy, the people won't oppress themselves. So the oppression was always coming from these other institutions, but they're gone. We got rid of them. So uh, we have nothing to worry about. Uh, and quickly, it became obvious that that's not the case. <laughs> in fact, the, in a democracy, the majority itself can, can be tyrannical on the minority. So Tocqueville develops this idea and says, well, associations are a counterbalance to that, a counterbalance to various tyrannical impulses in any society, and in, especially in a democratic society, and they serve as a counterweight. He calls it uh, kind of an alternative government. So it's imagining another way of being. That's what uh, political associations can do. Um, kind of holding out until they someday can gain a majority and have power and implement that vision. But the real benefit is they serve as a counterbalance, um, another way of thinking that staves off and kind of constrains the potential tyranny in a majority. That's very helpful. As we think, one of the reasons I think that this this right doesn't maybe get as much attention is because uh, there's not such a long history of case after case after you think of the kind of foundational cases of first uh, free speech, for instance, or religious freedom. But but they do develop, and and I I, I think I, I guess you would think of the NAACP versus Alabama case as maybe the first significant case. Um, what are some of the contours of the of the uh, of the right as it's been developed by at least by the Supreme Court to this point? Yeah, I, I think the NAACP case is the first case where the court sort of specifically talks about a right of association by name. But it harkens back in, in even earlier cases, uh, for example, and oh, I, I hate it when the name is blanking out on me, but uh, the Oregon uh, private schools case, you know, the Supreme Court said parents have a right to get together and educate their children. Uh, that was a freedom of religion case. It was a freedom of speech case. But in a way, it was also a freedom of association case that people can have a right to get together and come together in this sort of way. Um, so the basic contours of the right simply go to the ability of people to join organizations and to act through organizations. There, and I want to point out this includes not only we talk about nonprofits and so on, but you know much of what association is is about how you live your life. That idea of remember the pursuit of happiness that's there in the Declaration of Independence. Oftentimes, to initiate that, you need association. So even in mundane things, or maybe they're not mundane because they're controversial, like corporations. Corporations are associations of people in the end. They're they're not trees. They're not desks. They're not offices. They're a group of people who get together and they fund all those things and buy them and build them and and they operate as a you know corporation which is basically an, an association of these people it's a changing association people come and go as shareholders and so on but they're still an association moreover that corporation then associates with other people that associates with its employees it associates with its vendors it associates with the community around it so the association takes on many aspects there in terms of the legal Definition. I think the hot issues at the current time relate to a couple things. One is the right of people to keep their associations anonymous from the government. That to say basically it's none of your business what groups you I belong to, or if the association speaks conversely to say it's none of your business who belongs to our group. Uh, and and this has become a hot issue. A lot of people say the public has a right to know, especially if you're trying to influence public policy in some way. Whereas others would say no. Part of the whole purpose of association. Part of that whole benefit, again, is that you can be in a group, that you can't be then singled out for punishment, whether it's formal punishment from the government or informal punishment from the society around you or from people around you, that, that people who are timid, people who don't like being in the spotlight, 
don't have to be in the spotlight. They can just support an association and somebody from that association will speak their views for them. So that's one controversial issue. The other really goes, I think, to the issue of public accommodations these days and to what extent can we require somebody to associate with people they do not want to associate with. That's at the, again, the heart of these uh, net choice cases in the Supreme Court involving the tech platforms. But it also goes back to think about the, the civil rights era and public accommodations laws that, uh, you know, uh, equality in hiring and in housing and in, and in various things like that. And more recently, we've seen it come up. Again, they're often framed as free speech cases. And I don't think that's wrong, but in some ways, they really are association cases like Master Pete's Cake Shop and uh, 303 Creative, which are the two cases out of Colorado, one where the fellow didn't want to bake a, a particular wedding cake for a gay couple and the other where a woman did not want to design uh, a, a website specifically for a gay wedding. Dr. Sheen, do you want to say something about that, or? Uh, no, I think uh, I think that was uh, yeah, that was a good summary. I think that's right. You know, just for a second, I I think it's worth remembering that the details of the NAACP case really get right to the heart of why this is so significant. And it, in, in a way, it, it's probably I don't think they would have said it this way, but it has to do with with a privacy issue. Do you, do either of you want to summarize the facts of that case, or, or have me do that? Or yeah, I'll do that briefly. It, it's uh, the after Brown versus Board of Education, which is this case that desegregates the schools. Um, there was, you know, massive resistance, as it was called, throughout the South. And one of the forms of doing that was simply to harass the NAACP, which was constantly suing not only to get the schools integrated, but for, you know, other various uh, incendiary things involving integration and so on, things that we would view as quite normal today. But the um, so one of the ways the state did that was by launching a variety of investigations into organizations. Uh, in Alabama, they said, well, this, the NAACP doesn't appear to have properly registered with the state as a corporation and uh, so we need to investigate this and as part of investigating this we'd like to have the names of all your donors and supporters and members um, and you must have a list of those and, and they subpoenaed it from the NAACP well then the NAACP knew that turning over that list or making it public in the Deep South in the 1950s would be ruinous for at least some of those people involved. They might be exposed to violence or harassment or just social ostracization. And this probably wasn't only their supporters in Alabama. It probably included some of their financial supporters up in New York City and so on as well. So uh, the NAACP said, we're not going to give it to you. And the Supreme Court uh, uh, eventually sided with the NAACP. And, and that's where that, as I say, the first case that really talks about a right to association and says the right to speak, uh, the right of free speech for the NAACP is really enhanced by this association, not only to come together as an association, but to keep the names of those members private. So that's the basic contours of the sort of first case to officially talk about a right of association. And 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 actually, it's pretty similar to a mo more recent case, the the uh, uh, Americans for Prosperity versus Bonta case out of California. Do. You, uh, Dr. Shin, do you want to maybe take on that and describe the facts a little bit? Or? Uh, yeah, so uh, the basic facts are state of California um, expected <laughs> um, groups that operated there to basically give over their donors. Uh, it was a very similar fact pattern uh, to the state of Alabama. I mean, sorry, the state of California. Um, and they were going to keep that state state claimed it was going to keep them anonymous, but they wanted them. And it was the reason they gave was uh, administrative convenience. Should there be a problem, uh, we will we can investigate very easily. Uh, and it turns out governments being what they are, it was pretty easy to just get the list of donors. Uh, as it turns out, you could change, I think one of the lawyers found you could change uh, on the website, you could change like one letter or something and then get to the list. It was, uh, um, so even leaving that aside, um, groups refused to do so. Um, and so it made its way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, 6-3, uh, I believe, um, ruled on behalf of the organization. Um, and one thing that, that kind of came up in that case was there were lots of reasons you want to remain anonymous. Um, we live in a polarized age. Um, you can worry about retaliation in some sort, uh, but there's lots of other reasons. Uh, you know, the Abrahamic faiths encourage anonymous uh, giving. Uh, just You give, uh, but you precisely, you, the, you're going to do it uh, for honor from God, not from man. So you don't want to be revealed for that reason. Um, so the government deciding that, uh, that uh, you needed to give over your names of donations, there's all sorts of reasons that donors don't want to be revealed. And who ought to be making the decision, the group itself or the government on that? 
Yeah, if, I, if I can add a, a quick point on that, uh, along those lines, for example, Justice Scalia, um, the late Justice Scalia used to say that he thought people should have the courage to stand up and stand by their convictions. But another reason one might not want to be disclosed is, that, let's suppose you're, you own a business and you're successful and you're funding different causes, but you know that even though you're funding them from your personal funds, if you're publicly disclosed as supporting this controversial cause, or at least a cause some people think is controversial, it could lead to boycotts against your company, thus jeopardizing the jobs of people who work in the company, jeopardizing the value for shareholders, other shareholders in the company. So it's not so simple as saying that even if you have guts, or I always use, if any of you have read uh, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird or seen the great movie, right? And you remember, they don't go after... Uh, Gregory Peck's Gregory Peck, because he's a tough guy, you know, he's too tough for them. They go after his kids, right? That's who they go after. And so it, it, there are reasons why even if you're bold and brave and, 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 and eager to be out in public, you might want to, to be more uh, laid back. Now, you, you played a role in this this case. Do you want to say something about that? or that? Uh, I don't have too much to add to what, what Luke said, but I will add one point, which is, uh, so the Institute for Free Speech, which is an organization that I chair, uh, actually sued before Americans for Prosperity Foundation, which was the group that sued in, in Bonta. But they managed to pass us. They had better facts. The court liked their case better. So they are set in, in holding, waiting for them to grant our cert petition. And when they decided the Bonta case, then they immediately granted our petition and immediately overruled the lower court and sent it back said, do what we told you to do in Bont in the other case. But the, point, but the point I wanted to make is actually kind of interesting. At the first oral argument, and I, I don't have this, you know, exactly, but I'm not coming off too far from where it was. You know, they pressed the state, why do you need this information? And the state guy seemed totally flabbergasted by the question, the idea that what do you mean, why do we need the information? We didn't address that in our briefs. We don't think we need any reason for it. And I think that gets to the core, in a way, of the right to association. Does the government have to have a reason to get at this? And I remember finally the attorney, he says, well, law enforcement. I said, it's just law enforcement. And one of the judges kind of said, well, well you know, what do you mean by law enforcement? And he thought a bit and he kind of said, law enforcement. You know, it was really that kind of scenario. Um, but eventually the court, uh, the lower courts at least, did hold for the state. And I think the importance of Bont is recognizing that at a minimum, the government's got to come up with a reason before they can start asking you about, you know, who you talk with, who you affiliate with. Because think about it, that's what they're asking. They're saying, who have you talked with about politics? Who do you, you know, who do you hang out with? Who are your friends? And, and boy, that's just a recipe for all kinds of trouble. One of the things that's always admitted in Bonta is if the government needs it for an actual investigation. If they can say, we're investigating this problem, they can get it through a proper subpoena. But to just ask for it so that they have it available if it should be necessary, no. Or, 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 or in, in this case, if it's just easier for the, for the state to get a hold of that information because it's in their databases, right? That's the concern. What, what did the Supreme Court direct the lower courts to do in, the, in this case? I mean, what, what, what's the analysis after Bonta of, of an associational privacy type of right. Well, this bill gets into, uh, I, I probably have to go into more law than I'd want to do for an audience of, of, of <laughs> that's right, for an audience of non-lawyers and, and non-law students and in the time we have. But the court has various tests for how what they call compelling the government interest has to be in order to do something. And one of those tests is called exacting scrutiny. And the question was, what did it mean to impose exacting scrutiny on the government? And that was the standard they, the government had to meet to uphold this law in Bonta to collect all this information. And the importance of the case really is that Many judges over the years had interpreted exacting scrutiny as really not meaning much at all. The government just had to kind of give you a reason that made sense, and that was good enough. Uh, and, and in Bonta, the Supreme Court essentially says, you have to point to actual problems, uh, not just hypothetical problems, not just, again, well, we'd like to have it on our files because it may be useful someday. Um, you, you have to have something that, that's real there. And then when you address it, you don't have to address it in what in legal terms we call the least restrictive means possible. That is the, you know, the least you can do to get what you want. But you do have to address it in what the court called a narrowly tailored uh, uh, method. So by the way, if you're thinking about law school, this is probably going to turn you off to law school. Exactly, scrutiny narrowly tailored, you know. But, but you have to be narrowly tailored, which means it has to be proportional to what you want. So if the state of California really thinks it needs this information on donors to every nonprofit before that nonprofit can solicit contributions in the state, it has to, you know, have, have something that says this is the, how it needs 
to do it. And in this case, the, the state could not point to any examples where they had actually used this information. They had two or three cases where they'd used it, but on questioning, they admitted, well, we didn't really need it. We just happened to have it because we had this rule. And so we used it, but we didn't need it. We could have done the investigation without it. And the court said, that's not narrowly tailored. You know, even if you need it, the idea that you can just demand every association in the state, essentially, to give you this information on their members is not a narrowly tailored approach. What are some implications of, of that holding in other other areas? I mean, in uh, uh, maybe in pl the political context where this has also come up. Uh, uh, other other, what would be we look, what would be looking for in future cases that are going to cite to Bonta? Well, uh, the court had in CLS versus Martinez in two thousand and ten, um, where it ruled against uh, a student group at a public law school uh, in a 5-4 opinion. Um, it had basically said all the, the university can uh, require student groups in order to be a registered student organization. It can tell them they have to accept all comers. That was the holding. Um, so Democrats can't exclude Republicans. The Women's Law Association can't exclude men, uh, and so on. Um, and the particular facts, it was a Christian legal society, it cannot uh, require its members to be Christians, to uphold a statement of faith. Um, now, the, the standard that the court gives is, is very low. They had, the First Amendment absolutely applies in this context, but uh, you can't, no, no freedom of association, basically. Um, so with, with the Bonta case and, and some other more recent cases, the court seems to have been taking a stronger stance on association. So giving us exacting scrutiny, um, my quibble with the case is I, I do wish they had said uh, strict scrutiny, uh, uh, and I said this in a Law and Liberty essay, uh, but that's still pretty good, and they give us a, a stricter definition of that, um, So which um, would indicate that should it rehear something like Celis versus Martinez or a similar case, they're going to take a harder stance. Um, we've seen a few other recent cases where they, they they've tended to side with the organization. Um, so uh, in terms of, you know, employment at uh, religious organizations, um, their stance is, we aren't allowed to entertain an employment question <laughs> regarding religious organizations. It's entirely up. We aren't even allowed to ask a question of what is legitimate in a religious organization. It is beyond the purview of the government. Um, so they've taken some stronger stances in various ways. Um, and so I think with Bonta, we'll, what we I think we'll be seeing is just higher standards that they'll expect the government to meet um, to infringe in any way on freedom of association, I think. That sounds right. I, I think it's interesting because some of these cases do have the have a free speech or in this case uh, a, a religious freedom. Okay, but I think it's right to think of them as as involving freedom of association and how helpfully maybe maybe more clearly describing the contours of that case. I mean of of, of that right. Um, do, do you want to say any more about some of the campaign finance types of cases? Since I know you have a background there and. Uh, a, a, a great background there, but because because these are these are issues where uh, I think many people reflexively think, well, of course we need we need more disclosure, not less. But there are, there are good reasons to to to, to argue the opposite. Yeah. So so campaign finance is an area where uh, the the rubber really meets the road and a lot of things. First, it's an interesting First Amendment issue in and of itself. A lot of people say, well, money isn't speech. We should be able to regulate money in politics. And, and there are valid reasons to be concerned about the role of money, excessive large amounts of money in politics. But um, if you think about it, you know, if you can limit people, what people can spend, uh, then you can limit how much they can speak. You know, if you if you limit it, the New York Times to, you know, three thousand dollars per year, which is about the limit on what you can give to a candidate now, the New York Times would be a very very small publication. In fact, it would not exist. It would go under. If you limit speech uh, or limit you know, the spending of money, you can't do that. Think about it in a religious context. Imagine if we said, well, look, you can practice any religion you want. You just can't spend money to build churches or hire pastors or publish hymnals. Nobody would say, oh, well, that's, that's just regulating money, not religion. Obviously, it influences religion. So it's the same kind of thing with campaign finance. In the Bonta case, Justice Sotomayor dissenting uh, raised something that really wasn't in the case, but a lot of people thought was in the case, or at least said this is where the case is going to lead to, which is 
will not be able to, to require disclosure of campaign finance contributions. We won't know who's funding political parties and candidates. Now, historically, in the United States, we didn't know that unless people wanted to let you tell you. Up until the 1970s, uh, you didn't know that. You can decide for yourself whether our democracy works much better now than it did you know, in the 1950s and 60s and 40s and so on. But um, you know, there is, as, as Bill points out, a kind of a tendency for people to say, of course we need to know well, who's, who's spending the money. I, I do question that, and I sometimes put the, the question to people this way. Suppose the government said, look, we're concerned about Russian interference or Chinese, other foreign interference in our elections. So in order to head that off, we're going to require citizens to report to the government their political activity. We'll keep that in a government database, but we'll make that database available online to your employers, your nosy neighbors, potential creditors, you know, anybody else who just might want to know. How would you feel about that law? Most people I run into think that sounds like a terrible law. But we already have a sort of a truncated version of that law. It's called the Federal Election Campaign Act. Every state except for one has some kind of version of it at the state level, which is you have to disclose to the state who you associate with politically, who what candidates you give money to, what political parties you give money to, if you go out and spend money on your own, uh, who you spend it with, uh, and what you spend it for. And then the uh, government keeps that in a database, and it's there. So when you go in to interview for a job, uh, the you know now this probably is going to affect you know those of you who are college students probably are not making large political contributions at this point in your life, but there may be a point in time not too far down the road where that will come up, and the person can sit there uh, right on the computer screen while you're stepping into the office, look up your political contributions, and make a decision. You're not getting hired. Uh, I don't want you. Uh, or, you know, creditor could do that when you go for your home mortgage or, or anything else. And, of course, if, if we even if we made that illegal, they could probably come up with a reason to justify it. Say, well, I, I just didn't think they were a good credit risk, uh, but it really might be the politics. So it is, it is a serious question whether we really should be requiring disclosure even for direct political contributions. However, to summarize and answer Bill's question, I don't think Bonta necessarily leads there, and I don't think the Supreme Court has an appetite to go there. But I do think it's something we should think about more seriously, at least when we think about the amounts that should be contributed. For example, a lot of states now, you have to report this to the state if you contribute $10, even a dollar in some states, and that amount, amount should probably be much, much higher, uh, uh, just as a matter of washing most of that out of the system. Thank you. Very helpful. Uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, Professor Smith, the um, uh, the question of uh, public accommodations, and and that's an interesting case. You know, initially when public accommodations laws are, are enacted as part of the the uh, uh, Civil Rights Act in in uh, the early 1960s, they largely are are confined to what we think of as common carriers, the, the kind of uh, you know th uh, elements where there's a different interaction between a customer and the and the and the uh, the provider of services because you're in a tough spot, you're on the road, or you're staying at a hotel or things like that. But as states have enacted public accommodations laws, their definition of public accommodations is often much much broader, covering all kinds of things, including uh, the example uh, 303 Creative including a kind of a very small business and so maybe a single person or, or small businesses. What are some implications of the right of association for, or potential implications for uh, uh, the, these, these laws, or at least the expansive application of public accommodations laws and discrimination? Yeah, yeah so, so the right here, to be clear, is the right to say essentially, I don't want to do business with that person. And I think most of us would find that rather appalling if someone said, well, I don't want to do business with people of that race or you know, that people of that national origin or people of that religion. And, and in that context, uh, there's a great deal of sympathy for public accommodations laws. And I think that they do a great deal to make sort of our commerce go easier and smoother and, and actually enhance people's freedoms. You can go into places and know you're going to be served. Uh, we don't have uh, people trying to find out, you know, who you, who you support or who you're against or what race you're in and so on. But then there, but there is a question. So public accommodations laws are pretty well rooted at this point 
at the basic level. But it does come into interesting questions. As I say, the two paradigmatic ones are the two cases out of Colorado, 303 Creative, that you have to create a website uh, for a gay wedding and uh, a masterpiece cake shop. And if we think about those, in each case you had a sole proprietor. Now, they frame them for various reasons of doctrine and Supreme Court precedent, trying to make the best argument for their client as really questions of, you know, this is my First Amendment expression. I Each cake I make is individualized, and it's a work of art, and my website is. And I, I think there's some truth to that. They, I mean, they won large on those grounds, so, so okay. But I think to a large extent, the real problem there is that there, there is, I think, a difference between forcing a sort of individual person to, to, you might say, mouth the words that they don't believe, to say, you must say this, you must endorse this concept when you produce it, as opposed to telling, uh, you know, Ford Motor Company, uh, gee, you can't refuse to sell cars to Jews just because Henry Ford was very anti-Semitic a century ago. Uh, you know, we're going to say Ford's just cranking out cars. They don't care who they sell them to. You know, they're, they're just doing it. There's no kind of personal sense there in which they have to say, I endorse equality for the Jewish people. I think that's probably a good sentiment. I think most people at Ford today would have that. But you kind of get the analogy we're making. If somebody wants to say, I do not endorse gay wedding, I'll make this Cake, personal cake for any other thing, but I don't want to make a gay wedding cake. It's a very personal thing. It's, it's much more like forcing the person to speak. And the Supreme Court has long recognized that you can't do that. You can't force school kids to say the Pledge of Allegiance, for example, uh, and a whole host of other things uh, where you can't you know, force, especially children, but it also includes adults, to, to say things. That, that, that use of force, I think, is very off-putting. And so I do think small operations like that, we're going to need to figure out how do we want to handle these kinds of situations. It also goes, just to give one more quick example, like to, to fair housing laws. Normally, you can't discriminate against housing. Well, if you're a landlord and you've got hundreds of apartments or a big apartment complex, you know, you're just kind of renting them out. But if you're like a, a person and you're renting, you know, two rooms in your house, I think that's a different dynamic as to who you should be forced to rent to, even if we would, most of us might find your grounds for discriminating against some to be rather appalling. And, and, the, and the original uh, act has a Mrs. Murphy exemption for someone who has borders in their house and for that reason. Uh, we, we, we probably want to do questions, but do you want to say anything maybe on the, on the accommodate, public accommodations law point before we take questions? No, I think that was a good summary. OK, great. Well, um, I know some students are going to need to leave in a few minutes, but uh, and so we'll, we'll understand that you're not necessarily offended as you leave. But uh, um, and, and so feel free to walk out, I, I guess, about 10 till. But uh, one question here, please. And do we need this to send the mic over? Perfect. OK, thank you. Uh, my main question that we haven't talked about is um, I think freedom of association is really important for a civil society, but then I get really nervous when there's extremist groups that have views that I don't agree with. So even if they're like white supremacists or neo-Nazis are not particularly committing crimes, but they're promoting hate speech and trying to influence others to adopt those views, which I believe would be damaging for civil society, what is the responsibility of the government or what's the power of the government to limit them um, yeah, that's my question. Great, great question. Either of you want to address that? Yeah, so uh, a couple things uh, there. So uh, I call those sorts of associations the devil's association. So there are ones that, uh, not two reasons I say that. One is that the types of associations I think you're getting at is ones where everyone in this room would agree that they're, they're, they're bad, uh, they're nefarious influence. Um, I give that term to them. Uh, I got it from uh, A Man for All Seasons, if you've seen that movie. Uh, great movie from, what, 1961, I think. There's a great exchange in there between Sir Thomas More and his son-in-law, uh, William Roper, uh, which actually happened. Roper put it in, in his uh, biography of uh, Sir Thomas More. Uh, and Roper's a very uh, fiery uh, young lawyer, and he says, uh, I'd cut down every law in England to get to the devil. Um, so he accuses Sir Thomas More of wanting to give the devil the benefit of law. And Sir Thomas More responds, and he says, and when the devil turns around on you, where will you hide the laws all being flat? Do you think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? And so why would we give associational protections to these groups that we know 
or from the devil, the, the devil's associations. And the reason to give them associational protection is that if we cut down associational protections for them, because we want to get to them, uh, the devil will turn around on us. Um, and where will we hide? Where will be our associational protections when that happens? And it will happen. Uh, so why would we give them associational protections? It's because the, dis the lawful protection that protects them protected the NAACP um, when it was on the rocks. Um, and uh, Robert Putnam has pointed out that at the very height of the Jim Crow era, so uh, you know, circa 1900, so when that legal regime had really come into its own, uh, the, the most active demographic in civil society institutions, so benefiting from, uh, from this associational activity were black men. Uh, so it's, it's the, um, the, and that tends to be the case. Uh, the ones that socially would be the most excluded are the ones that most benefit from these associations. Uh, so those are the two points I'd make. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's very much a utilitarian answer. And the other, uh, in addition to the great analogy from, from uh, Sir Thomas More and the Man for All Seasons, it, it's just a, it's, it's John Stuart Mill on liberty, just as a utilitarian matter. He points out that, you know, you don't really know how good your own case is unless you're tested against adversarial positions. You can't refute the truth unless people hear it. And that reflects a deeper reality, which is, and we actually have some studies that are pretty good that show that this is the case, that when you try to censor these views, they just go underground and they fester more there than they do in the light of day. If they're really bad views, you've got to have some confidence that you'll be able to, to defeat them with better, better ideas and arguments. There's an interesting, you know, you, you mentioned the Pierce versus Society of Sisters about uh, trying to prevent Catholic schools from, from forming, and the, the, the major sort of proponent of that law was the Ku Klux Klan, uh, you know, try, trying to prevent Catholic education. So this is, this is uh, uh, that protection of association is, you know, protects all kinds of people, both, both bad and good, but, but ideally, ideally allows the good to, to survive against the, against the evil associations, right? I think ideally that's the case. Thank you. For that. I hope that's somewhat responsive to your question. We, 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 we of course, can come after and talk more. Please. Someone's coming. This feels like a, a rather ignorant question I'm going to ask, and so um, bear with if that, that is the case. Uh, freedom of association and marriage. Uh, what is the relationship there? And uh, this is just a curiosity. Is there, was there ever seen a, a connection between freedom of, associ freedom of association and marriage and the question of interracial um, rights of association and marriage? It's a rather odd question. I, I mean, I'll I just well, the, I just say from the legal standpoint, for example, when the court struck down restrictions on interracial marriage, it did not really refer to it as freedom of association. It kind of came under the broad rubric of privacy. Indeed, it's one of those things, and equal protection, primarily equal protection. Um, but I think it certainly could have been viewed as an association case, yeah. And it's one of those ways, again, in which almost everything, if you think about it, requires some level of association we need to protect. You have some deeper thoughts, I think, on, on the broader question of how that fits in. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it, marriage has never, as you said, been treated as associational rights. So interestingly enough, there's a Yale Law Journal from 1980 uh, making the arguments that uh, for intimate associations um, it, that, would, that would fit this. The court cites to it in 1984 uh, when it coins its term expressive association. So it says, we're going to attack freedom of association when they're intimate associations, which are families and family-like structures, um, and expressive association. So when you're engaging in the marketplace of ideas, those are the two categories of association we'll protect. And it drops the intimate association category and doesn't really do anything with it. It has the privacy jurisprudence which kind of handles that. Uh, so we don't usually talk about it in terms of freedom of association. Uh, but we could, right? A legal regime just hasn't ever treated it in that way. I think one one reason I think that that happened, if you don't mind, I, I, because because that was really interesting in the late seventies and early eighties, and there was sort of a you know why, why are we treating marriage different than cohabitation? It's all kind of a right of in you know, association. But a lot of but some of the specific implications of that right had to do with government benefits or of some kind or other, and so the, it wasn't so clearly a matter of private association when it was an association that was applying for you know something including a marriage license and you know that so i think that was one of the reasons that didn't make take on more but i think you're right it, it, it certainly could apply great thank you good, good question other questions that, uh, 
and, and it is five till if somebody needs to leave for class. We don't want to be the one to keep you from <laughs> being in class on time. I'm wondering if you might speak a little bit more about why different rights in the First Amendment, in your opinion, are treated with different levels of, um, well, of scrutiny, right? Um, but put, put more broadly, you know, for our students, different different levels of how seriously we take those rights. Why is it that uh, uh, association, you know, sounds like started out on kind of like a rational basis kind of, but, you know, maybe the courts elevated that now, um, at least in the, you know, starting in the 70s for religion, strict scrutiny was very much, for speech strict scrutiny has been. Why do we treat these differently? They're all in the First Amendment. Why do we seem to prioritize some over others? Is there a is there a logic to that, or is it just the chance of history and historical development of these different jurisprudences? Yeah, so that's uh, a massive question. Uh, so uh, kind of very briefly, uh, I think uh, that what's going on is you take freedom of speech um, is it's pretty self-evident how it relates to democratic engagement. Uh, so we're a democracy. We need free speech. The health of our state, uh, of our particular form of government, um, requires uh, free speech for that. When we're talking about freedom of association, you're talking about, uh, you're not necessarily talking about the health of, of uh, democratic governments. We're talking about the Quakers, they're going to go off on their own. Um, or we're talking about uh, um, other groups that aren't necessarily actually engaging in um, in the broad democratic dialogue. And in some ways, uh, they want to um, separate themselves off from that, have their kind of own small community, uh, you might say. Uh, I think C.S. Lewis referred to friendships as a, as a mini secession. It's seceding from the whole group and you're going to have your friendship. Uh, and I think that there's... Uh, Several people have written on this, uh, Philip Hamburger, um, the prominent uh, law professor, on um, that, that there's a sort of broadly democratic suspicion of that sort of activity. Uh, because that group's going to go off, the CLS, they're going to be separate from the rest of the law school um, around their religion and their religious beliefs and their peculiar moral beliefs, um, and they're going to be self-governing um, in their own small way, uh, deciding who's in and who's out. There's only about nine of them in that group. Um, and, and there's something broadly, uh, and I think this is Tocquevillian in the democratic imagination, um, that starts to be suspicious of that. Um, so Philip Hamburger has written on this as liberalism, kind of broadly understood, small l liberalism, the way in which we're all liberals, gets suspicious of that sort of activity. Um, interestingly enough, nativism also f finds that uh, very suspicious, which is why the Klan was so opposed to allowing for Catholic education and that sort of thing. It didn't want to see um, these other groups kind of be able to separate off, educate their children in their own way, and that sort of thing. Uh, so I think it's uh, a sort of, I call it democratic monism, a sense that we kind of all have to be the same. So we can have broad free speech protections uh, because um, that can protect our, our democratic society. But we start getting suspicious when we see the groups forming off, the Catholics over there and the Protestants over there. Um, it's, there's something uh, deeply rooted um, Again, it's democratic monism, um, maybe even um, some sort of uh, small-a authoritarianism that dislikes that sort of activity. And it is a massive question, but you know, more broadly, I mean, there's other rights like property rights get very little protection from the court. They're generally economic rights, as they're called, or rational basis. So if any rational person could think of any reason that might support this, of course, like, go to it, you know, good enough. Uh, and some of this comes about from a couple of ways. One, I think, is almost chance. One is a mistake. Of course, sometimes wrong. Two is, is chance, for example, in Buckley v. Vallejo, which is a major campaign finance case that created this exacting scrutiny standard. I don't think the court was trying to create an exacting scrutiny standard that would apply in later cases. I think they were just trying to describe what they were doing. They were kind of saying, well, we have to really subject this to exacting scrutiny because this seems like a big infringement on people's freedom. I don't think they thought of it as a, creating a test, but other lawyers come in and make it into a test, and then the court says, okay. So you get that. Uh, kind of thing going on. And then all of these, remember, the court doesn't usually connect these doctrines. In other words, they, they kind of have a doctrine for this type of speech and a doctrine for this and a doctrine for that, and they don't really connect them. I think one of the projects of the current court is to do more of that connecting into a coherent theory of originalism, but it's a long and messy project and, and may not work. Very, very hell. I think you're exactly right. I, I'm suspicious of those tests for that reason. <laughs> they do seem like they came up in language and then they, they sort of take on a life of their own. But I think, uh, maybe, maybe just say in conclusion, that I, I, Professor Sheen has actually wrote, written about the right of contract and the right of association and, and 
uh, and so that would be an interesting if you're interested in that it'd be helpful to look at his cv and uh, they both have such superb publications and things that I, I know I have a reading list now based on that. I, I think this has been really helpful. And I, I, I you know, the, the question of the importance of right, uh, right of association or associations generally really is a, an important one. I think it will be more important as we we've, we find ways to kind of interact with each other in, in helpful ways. And it's, it's, I think, the power of associations to form uh, kind of a uh, kind of a character of citizens outside of formal government channels that is the, is its power and why it will have seeing power regardless maybe of the way the Supreme Court might might uh, might approach it from time to time but I, I'm sure some of us will be willing on breaks and things to continue to talk about some of these issues but I hope you'll join me in thanking our, our excellent panelists. And